And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple. The he, he is the head of Audacity Interactive, and the who is, who is currently developing the very interesting affair with, Scar with Scarlet Republics, which we'll be getting into. The one and only Christian Rasmussen. Hopefully I got everything pronounced right. Um, yeah, it was perfect. How are you doing today, man? Or oh, I'm doing very well. I've, 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 entered, I've entered the open bar of the internet with a glass of wine in hand, and I, I, I do seek enlightenment. So, uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> so... One thing, it, one thing, it'd be, one thing I'm always curious about is delving into the humble beginnings. Um, so, what w what was kind of your break in moment when it came to gaming? Uh, like ge gaming in general, or, or developing the game? Um, well, I, I'll start. I'll start with what I'll start with what tuned you into the idea of gaming as as something to focus on with de with um, developing, and then we'll and then we'll segue into the uh, development of Scarlet Republics. Okay, yeah, sure. So, uh, so actually, uh, the, like, I've been a gamer like most of my life, like that I can remember, mm -hmm. um, but haven't really like done anything creative except for writing a, a very horrible fantasy book during high school, which uh, is hidden safely somewhere on a server that nobody can find. Uh, <laughs> apart from that, I've been uh, I've I've been into like business and politics. Uh, did a did a minor. Oh, sorry, right. Did my undergraduate studies in that and mm -hmm. was on track for a uh, for a PhD. Um, and uh, and in economics and 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 on the side of that, I did some some DMing, uh, Dungeon Dragons, uh, Vampires, Dark Ages mainly, uh, mm -hmm. which was. Uh, way too much fun. Uh, so I like kind of started the idea in my head that maybe that could be really awesome if uh, if that could become a living. Um, but I guess it was just an idea. Uh, and then my uh, my crazy partner, who I, I, I co-founded the studio with, one morning uh, we were sitting there writing our master thesis, and he was like, "Hey, should we just when this is over, should we, should we try to build a company and, and, and do a game?" And I said, "That sounds like a terrible idea." Like, <laughs> We don't have any. We don't have any experience. We don't. We don't know anything. So I, uh, I, I went home and uh, I didn't really sleep that night. And uh, and and thoughts started forming. And then I came the next day and said, "Okay, let's let's try to do that." It's, it's, it's still a terrible idea, but but, but you got me. Uh, and that's roughly three years ago mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, now when it came now um. You, it's funny that you mentioned Vampire Dark Ages as as something that you had run because, of her, putting aside the fact that it's, it seems that world, it seems that World of Darkness was a lot is a lot bigger in Europe than I had previ than I had previously thought, um, was that was some was some of your experiences with that game one of the minor influences with um, taking the direction for Scarlet Republics that you do. Yeah, certainly. I mean, like, I um, thought Dark Ages is, is 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 an incredible game to run. Uh, mm -hmm. It's 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 a really hard game, I think, especially for for the players and and, and for the storyteller because it's so uh, with a lot said with a lot of love for the game, uh, like open uh, and to to a certain degree unbalanced. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it it requires a lot of a lot of intelligent role playing and a willingness to not min max and abuse the systems uh, because they're not balanced at all, basically. Uh, and some of the things that we took from it is the very heavy focus on, on character and and the uh, because there's no like great tome of beast. Well, there is, but 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 kind of to me, Vampire Dark Age is just the most fun when you pit vampire against vampire uh so it's very much more uh low fantasy much more gritty much more political uh than than say D, &D for example typically mm -hmm. is uh, at least when i run campaigns and uh and i think that 
that some of that has definitely carried over to to scholar republics and and the sort of amount of world building that's necessary to do as a storyteller to pull that off you know like you kind of when you if you want to run a good vampire campaign you need to uh figure out who the local princes are how their courts are uh, figured out you need to know sort of who the vampires are around there's a lot of political world building there's a lot of character world building there uh if you really want to do something nice for your players that you need to take take care of and and that has definitely shined through in in how we built the characters and the and the storyline for scarlet republics yeah mm-hmm. um mechanics wise i don't know i guess we we sort of our initiative system i guess is sort of a nod to the vampire system but then again not not at all yeah. <laughs> now, Winnick, now you've described um, Scarlet Republics as the as the love child of um, Fire Emblem and and uh, Divinity, with a with a Joe Abercrombie book. Um, now, I think I think for a lot of people who saw the Kickstarter for the first time, this might be their first introduction to the to um, something like Joe Aber- Abercrombie. So. Could you go into a bit of a bit of that and um where and where the influence was um with hit with his work? Yeah, so for those that doesn't know, Joe Abercrombie is is a fantasy uh, author um who is sort of one of the pioneers of the subgenre of fantasy that one would call grimdark, um mm-hmm. which is mostly low fantasy. It's it's gritty. It's character driven. It's gray. It's uh, satirical. Uh, um, so usually characters are deeply flawed. Um, there's no sort of like classical good and evil fight. Um, uh, and he, he, he did some, he, he, he writes wonderful, wonderful books and, uh, w- with a lot of focus on flawed characters and betrayal and characters who can't quite seem to live up to their potential. Um, and also about how structures in society, uh, lock characters in, which is very fascinating in a fantasy world where you also have magic uh, mm-hmm. that can that can help to do that. Uh, and and his work shines through a lot in um, in how we've how we sort of came up with the story and the characters and and their journeys and the avenues for players to explore with choices and uh, and 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 how they how they decide to take the story through their how they play the game, uh, especially uh, his book Best Served Cold, which is which was basically sort of something we had deeply in mind when we designed the the campaign uh with the diff- it's also put in sort of like a city state setting uh now Kusano, our, our fantasy world has is, is has changed a lot and and it's is it's not that reminiscent of Styria, which is his world uh, anymore but uh but but back in the days there was definitely like a lot of influence a lot of inspiration uh from his work mhm mm-hmm. now the other part of the other part Part of that that I'm, cur- that I'm curious about is the no- is the notion of the whole fi- the whole fire emblem um, divinity um, relationship. Now, I'll start with the divinity part. Now, I'm get I'm guessing that when you're in when you're bringing up divinity with this, the main one that you're bringing up is the original sin games. Yeah. Um. That that was what I'd guess because um, if you were bringing up something like Ego Draconis, then I would have had to raise my eyebrow because um, the stuff before Original Sin is vast is vastly different. Yeah. Um. And I'm I'm guessing that, I'm, I'm guess was Original Sin your introduction to that particular series, or were you familiar with Divinity before that? I, I wasn't. Original Sin was uh, was. Um... Uh, was my introduction to it. I mm-hmm. played through both games with my uh, uh, co-creative director uh, Gustav, who also mm-hmm. helped me write the story and design the game for Scarlet yeah. Republics. Um, yeah, so that was my introduction to that whole universe. Uh, I haven't really explored what came before. Mm-hmm. Um, um, and, and, and regarding sort of the Fire Emblem meets Divinity, I guess that's our way of saying that the game aims to be a marriage between uh, certain Western like tactic, tactical stables such as like the isometric cameo view, the way we approach sort of like character building, especially with skills and stuff like that. Uh, and and the aesthetic is is thoroughly Western and not Japanese. It's, it's not an anime art style as, as as anyone can see. But we also cobble it with a lot of Japanese mechanics and a lot of Japanese 
uh, aesthetics in the way that the story is told. Like the dialogue scenes looks to me, the aim with those was to make something that looks Western and is set in a Western fantasy aesthetic, but also is recognizable as something that is reminiscent of a JRPG and the way the presentation is made. Yep. Um, yeah. Um, out of curiosity, what was your introduction to um, Fire Emblem? My introduction to Fire Emblem was Fire Emblem, I believe, 7, which is the first, no, the second GBA game, but the mm -hmm. first one released in the West. Uh, I played that and Sacred Stones, and I later played the translated uh, version of 6. Um, then I played, uh, the, the like, the GameCube one is one of my favorite games ever, uh, Path of Radiance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's, I, I think, and now I, I might make certain people... Uh, angry in the internet. I don't know, but to me, that has the best story of all the Fire Emblem games, uh, which, which was continued into uh, 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 Fire Emblem 10 uh, for the Wii, uh, which I uh, liked, but but not as much as 9. Um, yeah, then I played the DS games, uh, 3DS one. No, there was no 3DS one, were there? Yeah, there, um, were. there were no. Yeah, there, there were. were there were three. There were uh, DS and 3DS ones. Um, there were. There were. I'm. I'm. I'm just confused with 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 DS and 3DS because I used to play a lot of DS games on my mm -hmm. 3DS and I get confused <laughs> which games belong to which console. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, but yeah, not a huge uh, fan of Awakening. I really liked Fates, uh, and uh, I've also like put in like 100 hour plus into into Three Houses. Uh, yeah, it's 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 one of my favorite series, but. Uh, but okay. I haven't I, I I haven't gone back and explored like one to five apart from the like the remasters. I played Shadow Dragon and mm -hmm. and the remaster of Fire Emblem Two, and I touched upon Shadows of Valencia, but uh, didn't didn't it didn't really reel me in. Um, it was it wasn't too long ago that you probably already found out about this, but it wasn't too long ago that um Thracia got a fan translation. Yeah, yeah, I haven't been able to look at that yet. Which um. No. That one's particularly inf infamous <laughs> because of because of how hard it is, even by Fire Emblem standards. Um, yeah. Okay. So no, I haven't had time. Yeah. So um, when it comes now, when it comes to the setting of Scarlet Republics, um, Corsano. Yeah. Um, now it's mentioned that a lot of it is inspired by by the Italian Renaissance. What? What particular drew, what particularly drew you to have that style as your um, focus? That was actually uh, um, so. The thing is that we sat down and knew that we wanted to do a fantasy strategy RPG with choice and consequences as a central mechanic, like mm -hmm. branching storylines and multiple endings. Uh, and then we sort of came up with a bunch of different settings that could potentially facilitate that and by that i mean very top level settings uh, we had such like like uh, like a tyrannical setting like an empire uh, where you had to either play as the tyrant or stand up to the tyrant uh, we had like a tribal setting uh, where it was more like uh, shamanistic and stuff like that we had like a classical more medieval crusade king and country setting uh, and then we had the city state setting uh, which we which we sort of ended up with as the most interested thing because i think it allows for a lot of backstabbery and alliances between the different cities and between the different families within the different cities. So, so any like anybody who's watched the early seasons of Game of Thrones will will sort of understand what I'm trying to 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 aim at here. To have all these different factions that the player can interact with and battle against. Um, uh, so we needed something where there could be a lot of conflict because strategy RPG without fighting is barely a strategy RPG. Uh, so, so the different cities allowed for that, like a lot of different factions, both between the cities and within the cities. And then there also needed to be some meat for the dialogue and the story to latch on to in terms of, uh, of having like, uh, like factions and different views and different political figures that you could befriend or, or, or like, or on. Um, so, so we ended up knowing that we wanted to do some sort of city state setting and then you have sort of the Greek city-states and the Italian ones as the most interesting historical periods to draw attention from. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't until our art director joined the team and had this idea of making the art style of the game very focused on the Italian Renaissance and on Leonardo da Vinci's work in particular, 
um, and started doing the art style and then sort of story and art merged together into what is today become Cosano, uh, the setting of the game. Uh, but that was like a co-joint effort between art design and writing uh, since he joined. Yeah, that, I guess mm-hmm. that's the story. Yeah. Now, when it com- now when it comes to um, I think, and I seem to have lost my spot. So I was I was look I ha- I have a few bu- I have a few bullet points on on mine that I was looking that I was looking through now. Yeah. When now um. When it comes to when it, when it comes to said combat, you you mentioned going with isometric. You it's very cl- it's very clear from the um, demonstration footage that you're go- that you're going with a grid based approach. Um, but one one th- there is a couple of things that I'm curious about when it comes to this mar- when it comes to this marriage of, of um, ideas. The first of which is one of the things that Fire Emblem is partic- is particularly famous for is the weapon triangle. And mm-hmm. now obviously I'm not expecting exactly the same thing in this case, but do you ha- but do you have a weapon relationship set up um within your within Scarlet Republics? Uh yes and no. So we don't have a system where specific weapons have like an advantage against other weapons because there are other weapons. But we do have uh, um, our dueling system, which is a system that works the way that whenever you engage in melee combat, your weapon has a bonus that applies on your opponent. Uh, so, for example, if I'm equipped with a sword or a rapier or another light weapon, they mm-hmm. usually mess up with foe's evasion uh, because it's easier to, to find an opening with like a light weapon where you can stab, dagger, rapier, whatever. Uh, if you have a spear, halberd, another long weapon, usually you mess up the foe's accuracy. Um, like big weapons like hammers and war axes uh, mess up the foe's defenses. And then you can have sort of like kite shields and offensive other types of offensive shields that can mess up with the foe's attack. And then you have all sorts of uh, like symbiotes and mixtures, um, which is actually going to be sort of a lot of the trade offs you're going to make when you're outfitting your company. Uh, in terms of what weapons to equip and what armor to equip is is what is the dueling effect of my melee weapon um uh and also when you're on the actual battlefield how to determine which units should be fighting which units um for example you don't want to go against somebody with a spear with a low accuracy weapon because then it's going to be very very hard to hit that person Mm -hmm. um yeah, so so there is there is interaction between the different weapons in in melee combat, uh, but it's not a rock paper scissors system. All right, um, it's it sounds like it's more it's more about figuring out what defense what defenses that somebody has is the weakest and taking advantage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could say that, or or at least at least deal with it because some of them are are defensive. Like the, the the accuracy debuff, the attack debuff, but some of them are also offensive, like mm-hmm. the weapons that make it easier to hit or the weapons that make it that make you do more damage in general. Uh, and they also affect other people on the battle map. So if I'm engaged in a duel with somebody who has a evasion reducing rapier, then anybody else who goes up and attacks me also benefits from that. So the dual bonuses stack. So you can sort of if if you engage on all four sides. You are you're facing uh, the penalties of four different weapons, so mm-hmm. it's important to not like tactically. You should try to gang up on enemies, and it's important not to become ganged up upon because that makes your characters' uh, the fighting chances much much slimmer. Yeah. Now, when it com- now um when it comes, I want to I want to shift into a lore question for a bit. When it comes to yeah. Corsano, um. Mm-hmm. Like when the way it's the way it's described on the um, Kickstarter page leads me to believe that the majority of your adventures are in within the story are going to take place in and out of this particular city state. Um, is that is that the case? And if so, are we going to be seeing different districts and different areas of Corsano? Yeah, yeah, no, uh, no. The the whole sort of without spoiling too much the the whole key with the story is that it has several chapters 
uh, each with a different city state in the focus. So you tour the city state, so to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, so a, a lot of the promo stuff we did for the for the Kickstarter it takes place within the city state of Astore, but you'll you'll visit all of them if 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 your choices bring you there some of them you won't see uh if you choose to side with various factions or choose to do specific things in the story so, so there might be some of the areas that you don't get to visit in your first time around but uh we plan to have all the city states there as, as, as places to explore um mm-hmm. yeah um yeah now and, and i mean they're different. One mm-hmm. of them is kind of like a Tortuga-inspired pirate mm-hmm. city. Uh, one of them is more Venice-esque. Uh, we also have uh, um, one that's very technological, very advanced. And uh, the one that you're seeing, the industrial one, Astore, um, which is sort of like, sort of actually inspired by Attack on Titan. It has like, mm-hmm. the, and, and, and historical Rome with a lot of different wars and like trolley systems and steam-esque mechanic, uh, mechan- uh, machines and, and stuff like that, also inspired by some of Da Vinci's work uh, with all of his sketches where he, he would dream up like crazy the amalgations of, of technology that the world was not ready for. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, now, when it comes... Now, <clears throat> it's mentioned that within Scarlet Republics, the primary um, viewpoint will be Remo and, Val- and Valeria. Yeah. Um, now when I saw, when I saw that you would be playing as, as, as two, as two, um, mercenary captains who are, si- who are siblings, um, mm. for whatever reason, I ended up thinking of, um, the approach that was done with Astral Chain, where one of them, where you pick between one of the two si- siblings and the other one becomes an NPC for the rest of the campaign. Um, mm. are you dealing with, are you dealing with something like that with this, or are we dealing with two um fully realized characters so actually we have right now on the campaign the next stretch goal which is the strategist uh, stress stretch goal mm-hmm. so uh right now uh, uh one of the siblings you choose one of the siblings to be the commander in the very start of the game the commander of the mercenary company and right now uh, the other sibling and then the other sibling becomes the strategist more like a diplomat a quartermaster role and uh, that's a part of the game where we have some cool ideas, but we haven't really implemented or, or really like designed the whole f- feature yet. Um, but it's something that we have as a stretch goal. So if we make uh, uh, our next stretch goal in the campaign, that will actually happen. That the strategist will become a class in the game, but mm-hmm. it's going to be a very different class. It's going to be a class that directly impacts with what you can do strategically, your stratagems, your supply chains, your what you can do with your base camp, uh, what base followers are going to come and join you, uh, how your diplomatic relations to the different city-states and the different factions of the world are, uh, and the skill system like uh, of the strategist interwebs with that. So uh, so if we make that stretch goal, and I'm pretty confident that we will, um, then, um, then, then you'll have a fully-fledged class for the strategist. Um, otherwise, it'll be a character that's very important to the story, obviously. But, uh, but yeah, so that's the plan for that. Yeah, and of of course this is this is um built within the framework of the mer- of the Black Wings Mercenary Company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And when it come when it comes to that, I'm ge- I'm guessing that there's a, that there's going to be a mix of named characters and more hired um characters of di- of different archetypes. Uh, no, actually, uh, the game will have approximately 20 named characters that you can pick and choose your squad from Mm -hmm. squads will for most battles squads will range between six and eight characters so more closer to divinity or XCOM than than fire emblem where you could often Mm -hmm. have like 10 12 characters um so you don't get to bring as many uh but uh but uh, but those are but but all that you bring are named and like uh, part of the part of the actual story and lore of the game um some of them are choice exclusive so you won't have all 20 of them in one playthrough but mm-hmm. uh but uh but every character that you can control in battle will be a, will be a fully developed character yep now when it come now when it comes to um you mentioned xcom so i ha- so i have to get the obvious gag out of the way sure. are yeah. we are we dealing with xcom level rng <laughs> <laughs> 
uh, <laughs> well, to to a certain extent. I mean, uh, I, uh, I I have heard from some some playtesters that the RNG is uh, is is a bit brutal. It's obviously something that we're balancing, and we wanna mm -hmm. we wanna give you the best experience possible. Uh, but I also like it when numbers don't lie, and when when the actual chance that you see on the on the percentage is the chance that you you actually have for hitting or missing, scoring a critical hit. So yeah. triggering certain skills, so to say. If you if you if your mindset is that the numbers don't lie, I think that's going to disqualify you from X from XCOM level RNG. Probably because yeah. you've pro you've probably seen that meme of ninety five percent chance to hit, still end up missing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, those five percent happens once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I don't know the inner workings of. Uh, of of K2 and and Paraxis. I don't know if uh, if 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 they actually cheat with the numbers or if uh, if if people just feel miserable being unlucky once in a while. Uh, but it is it is a it is a it is an interesting thing to watch the the, the online discussion and like the the feedback and reception to the RNG system of XCOM for certain. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Now I, I guess it's because mm -hmm. it's paired. It, it's when when it's paired with the permadeath system and when with the with with when when hardcore players play the Iron Man mode difficulty and stuff like that, then then RNG systems that are not very forgiving of 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 players can be frustrating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, when it, now um one one phrase that you that you ended up um, introducing when ta when mm -hmm. talking about the uh, state that the city states are in is da vinci punk yeah and i'm curious i'm curious i'm curious what that entails and where it would differ from something like steampunk or diesel punk yeah so so i guess it it's 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 a, it's a, yeah it's a term that we came up with i don't really know if i if if, if i'm i'm that proud of it i mean when you say something is punk, so suddenly some of the some of the mystery goes away, and and then you can sort of put it in some sort of box that's punky and stuff. So, so so, but but uh, but uh, but yeah, we use the phrase. So I guess, I guess, I guess I I should I should own it. Uh, but it's uh, it's it's basically a mixture of 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 steam and you know like trolley systems, a lot of wires, a lot of a uh, lot of little engines, stuff like that. And then Da Vinci, who used a lot of wood. In his sketches and imagination, so it's basically uh, reminiscent of steam, but with more wood and less metal. Mm -hmm. I guess sort of the the symbol the symbol answer. And then of course, where steam is is something that you can slap on basically anything that has to do with uh, heating up water. Um, uh, da Vinci Punk is called that way because it's so inspired by Da Vinci and and what he did, like his imagination, all of his crazy crazy ideas. Um, so, for example, if you, if you've seen the Kickstarter trailer, we have this 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 tank enemy, which is a tank that Da Vinci um, dreamed up back in the days, and then we thought, hey, why not put that on on four legs and have somebody riding in it and see if uh, I mean it's a fantasy world, it could work. So uh, so it's uh, it it's 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 obviously it's obviously part of it is that. It's related to him, and mm -hmm. uh, and then I would say that that it, it it is more it's more woody it's more it's more tactile than certain certain types of steampunk. Yeah. Now, within the now within within that, I'm guessing how um how it's said that the it's said that the city states are on the brink of an industrial revolution, but when it comes to this um this new kind of technology how widespread is it how ubiquitous is it so um so lore wise we have these corals which are the the power source of uh, of the city states uh, which is recent it's recently been been discovered that the heart of these corals can be burned with a power that's more potent potent than oil 
Um, so it's not very widespread yet. Uh, it hasn't been around for more than a couple of decades. Uh, obviously in Satona, which is the very technological city state, it's huge. In the industrial city states, it's huge. It is changing warfare slowly. You're seeing like early gunfire, you're seeing cannons, you're seeing bombs and different munitions. Uh, but it is, it is, it is still not where it is still not at a place where a disciplined army with good old fashioned swords and spears wouldn't be able to topple somebody. Uh, uh, with a piece of blaze technology, uh, but it is it is it is spreading, and it's also I think uh, just as importantly a huge economic factor. Like for for the world, uh, there's a lot of power games uh, concerning the coral reefs where the corals are mined, uh, and you will you will get to to visit some of those in the game and uh, and get close to the. Uh, yeah, sort of gold rush uh, financial side of things, um, as well as the deeply technological, I get to have a cool gun and cool grenades on my characters side mm -hmm. of it. Now, of and of course, the, um, I, <laughs> I, will, I will admit getting a kick out of seeing the, um, the art for the Blaze engine, which yeah. is just, which, um, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure that's well. That's well versed in giving somebody nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> the little horsies. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe maybe Art. it's the fact that I read Sleepy Hollow one too many times as a kid. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Akash has a uh, has a penchant also for for like uh, the gothic and the and the, and the horror stuff. And uh, sometimes he's he's allowed to have it uh, to have it shine through in in the world that's otherwise very renaissance and colorful. Uh, and I think it, if we strike the right balance, I think it's going to be really really awesome. Well, the way you describe that, I'm getting the image of him, of him trying to sneak some stuff some stuff in and and fights ensuing o over. Over some over certain designs that might lean a little too gothic, <laughs> that image would not be totally off without saying too much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's uh, I think the sentence, Akash, I love the design. Maybe tried without the skulls has been said like way too many times. But uh, but I also really appreciate uh, that he tries to take it in some of those directions. And mm -hmm. I think the the end product uh, speaks for itself. That it's uh, it's gonna be something. Something that caters to a lot of different uh, different imaginations and uh, and fans of, uh, of fantasy in general. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to talk about the pattern because yeah, a lot of a lot of times in now this is not this is not something that's um that's a that's just that's just guilty in in Eastern or Western um fantasy games. This is something that happens. A lot more often than I'd like to admit, magic is something that is ju is just a case of it just works that way. Yeah. Whereas with th this case, you have this set this setup called the pattern. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to that, the first question I have is, what was the what would you say would be the main inspiration? the main inspirations for the design of the pattern as the idea for magic's um, source. So first of all, I, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit backwards on that and say that it, I think it was very important to Gustav and me when we, when we like did a lot of the world building for the game, that there was a coherent magic system uh, that wasn't just fireballs and invisibility spells or some kind of like grand power or something like that. Uh, both of us are really huge fans of Brandon Sanderson. And uh, if, like, if he can really like design a magic system. Uh, I think a lot of animes actually also do a good work of, of setting some ground rules mm -hmm. for how powers work uh, in in the power system or the magic system of, of the world that they take place in. Uh, and I think it's something that's often like uh, wasted opportunity. Yeah, like a lot of a lot of fantasy game, fantasy and book fantasy, where the like. The, poor book fantasy in my view the magic is is just like ah then the mage cast a fireball or something uh which which can be good for 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 like D, &D campaign or something where you want to have something that's very open and stuff like that but but for for a storytelling where where magic has to work especially in a low fantasy world i think you really need to set some boundaries and and figure out how it works and i think the idea with the pattern was 
a mixture of some of the work by authors such as Brian McClellan and and, and Brenda Sanderson, mm -hmm. uh, but also also like inspirations from the period, like Renaissance art, mosaics, uh, some of these sort of like like seeing beyond something. Um, uh, yeah. I guess there, there was a very there's a very very old draft of the game where the magic was based on cigarettes. Like you had to smoke certain herbs to uh, to to get the powers and activate the powers. That that was for some reason I don't know why it deemed. Uh, I I don't know if we thought it was too silly or too too weird. Um, yeah, and then then we wanted. I, I also think that the thing that got me really excited about designing the pattern system in the end was also some of Akash's like our art team's early designs of how it could look with like mosaic and something very colorful and very mysterious. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then it's for the characters that live in that world, it's, it's basically, I mean, it is magic and you would call it magic, but it's, but it's also science. Like the pattern is something that's also been there. It's something you can study. It's something that has laws that you need to adhere to uh, like gravity or whatever so so because everything has a pattern like gravity is its own pattern mm -hmm. moon tight tight tidal system has a pattern like there's enormous giant pattern like time and and uh, like uh the gravity or society or something like that and then you have tiny little patterns like pattern of the pattern of a mouse or the pattern of a tiny little pebble uh but it was important to me that th that it was something that was that was systematic and something that had like a thought up system for how it worked and how it can be studied and how it can be utilized. Oh, all right. Um, now when it come when it comes to it, the, um, I will admit that one of the things that came to, that came to mind for me for a bit was, um, was stained glass art. Yeah. Um, and with, with that in mind, is it, is it a case where, where anybody could t could theoretically learn how to how to use patterns, or is it a case where you have to be born with the ability? So, uh, like, there there are different kind of ways that you can use the pattern magic. Um, some of the lesser powerful pattern magic is what we would call shift magic, uh, which is basically uh, uh, you changing the pattern of yourself uh, into something stronger it's always a trade-off like the pattern can't you can't just make yourself magically stronger you have to weaken the pattern in other ways like you could become duller or less sensory adept or stuff like that uh, uh, but most people are able to learn a certain level of shift magic if nothing else intuitively like for example a very good runner would probably intuitively be shifting his pattern a tiny bit um, and then you come into the more complex uh, ways of pattern magic like shape magic which is changing the patterns of others and siphon magic which is siphoning the pattern of others which is much more complex and that you have to learn and to a certain degree also have a talent to be able to learn like just like in, in the real world that everybody is not born with the ability to become a master mathematician at least I, I mean depending on how you how your worldview is of course but mm -hmm. uh but but you have to have a certain affinity for the pattern to utilize the higher arts of pattern magic now when now when it comes to the um game plan of things is um is is pattern use treated um like M like mp or does it have or does it have its own quirk as far as how as far as how it's used so that it doesn't um get abused too much yeah, so it has it has a a, a mana esque system called stability, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, when you attack somebody with pattern magic, you are affecting their stability. Stability can also be uh, affected by other things like war cry of a warrior or like a stun grenade from a sapper or something like that. But uh, but mainly its influence is through magic. And when you utilize pattern magic, you also open up your own pattern, destabilizing it. Uh, and if you become fully destabilized, your pattern will break, and that is very bad because then you get a reduction in uh, all of your stats and will have a hard time fighting for the rest of the encounter. Uh, so you have to be careful uh, not to overuse it. Um, 
and especially when there are enemy mages like also trying to destabilize you and um, and breaking your pattern uh, we try to make it into a system where sometimes trying to break the pattern or destabilizing a foe is as interesting as just dishing out damage to give you like different avenues of how you can how you can approach the, the various encounters so the short answer is mm -hmm. yes yeah now when it comes now when it comes to um <laughs> When it now, when you mention stability, th are there are there going to be um, any detrimental effects if that ends up getting completely depleted? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's a huge like debuff to all your stats, so it's going to be much more hard to 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 fight. And uh, status effects like stun or taunted or poisoned, which you usually have like a chance of resisting, auto applies. So if you're completely depleted, you're much more susceptible to negative status effects, and you're weaker in, in all regards until the mm -hmm. end of the encounter. Now, when the the other thing is when it comes to um pat when it comes to pattern sight, um, I'm get I'm guessing that th that you don't want this to be treated as just as just a filter, but that or, but rather something that is going to have some gameplay uses during encounters. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, I, I don't think we're still fully settled on how far we want to go in that direction. Um, uh, there's definitely, it's definitely going to be more than just a cool effect. Uh, but I also think that we have a lot of other cool and engaging systems. So I don't want it to take over too much from the duels and uh, other systems and the class synergies. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I would say that that one is still a bit in design. But, uh, but yeah. And e even though it's in, de even though it's in design, there's still, there's still the mindset of, of not making it, not falling into the k trap of it having, of it being just a glorified Photoshop filter. Yeah, I mean, we've uh, we, we've we've had a, we have a lot of ideas. Like basically, if the stealth system, uh, where the the phantom, which is a class for the subclass of the marksman, uh, uses the pattern as a cloak to sneak through, so maybe you have to trigger pattern sight to be able to discover uh, enemies uh, sneaking towards you, or you can have enemy like scouts or or outposts that are able to spot you there. So that's mm -hmm. kind of an idea that we are playing with. Um, we're also playing with the idea of like being able to do sort of ambush-esque attacks uh, through the pattern and using pattern side to also gauge the strength of an enemy and stuff like that. So there's, there are all kinds of different directions that we could take it, uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still a bit early in like the final balancing of those, of those things in, in saying how much of it is actually going to end up in the game. Yeah. Now... One of the things that you t that you talked about when it came to um, the combat system is dynamic turns. Now, yeah. when I think about that, the image that comes to my head is that based on the actions that are taken by participants, the turn order isn't always going to be the sa the same or the same order um, consistently. No, that's that's right. Uh, so when you enter when you start an encounter, you uh, you roll for initiative. Um, and you have a core initiative stat, um, mm -hmm. so so turn orders are gonna be sort of controllable. Uh, but then, as uh, as the battle progresses, initiative is a stat like any other that can be changed. That can be that can be messed up by if you're dueling with enemies that have spe specific weapons uh, that lower initiative. Can be messed up by debuffs. Can be changed around. And then we have the commander, which is the like the Remo of Valeria, whoever you choose, which has the ability to mess with the initiative. Like that's kind of what they're what their class is all about, like moving your own units around in, in initiative, having them like come out early or late to to plan strategies uh, efficiently, and you have certain enemies that can that can do stuff there as well for some nasty surprises for the players. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, now, obviously when it comes to pattern sight and stability, we've already we've already covered that, and um, mm -hmm. same and same with the uh, dual system, um. So I want to talk about traumas. Yeah. Now, I get the I get the sense that trauma does have the whole three, does have the whole three strikes you're out kind of thing. But what I'm curious about is is there the possibility of um per, of permadeath? 
In the same so way that there's... there was with Fire Emblem. Yeah, so basically the trauma system is a way of having lasting consequences for losing characters while reserving character death to the story. Uh, um, because I think, uh, being a huge fan of Fire Emblem, I do think sometimes that a permitive system messes up what you can do with character development over the course of a story. Mm -hmm. uh, except for, and you also see this with Fire Emblem, that the most important characters usually don't die, they just, like, retreat or something and are too wounded to continue fighting or something like that. Um, so we wanted to have a story where all of the playable characters could keep influencing it until the very end, uh, which is when you're already doing a branching story with multiple endings, very, very hard to do if you also do like proper permadeath. Uh, but it's not that characters can't die, like they certainly can if you if your actions in the story like cause it. Uh, and also if you have three th traumas, then the character is considered too traumatized to proper function in battle. Um, um, and we might also at uh, hardcore difficulty mode where where that number is lower than three. You know, for the masochist in all of us. Yes, yes. As a, as, a, as somebody who's who's completed Fire Emblem Conquest on Lunatic, I uh, I proudly count myself as a masochist. That was that was excruciating. That was, uh, yeah. And and what? Well, it's not it's not like I'm one to talk on that given given the fact that I still that I still have a I still keep a copy around of um Kaizo World. <laughs> Ooh. There's uh, there's some there's the there's the definition of pain if you if I ever saw it. Yeah, yeah. Um aka the reason why I have a punching bag in my office. It's good. It's good that you have that. Otherwise, you would have to. You would have to like the screens break, and that's 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 that gets expensive quickly. <laughs> well, not just that. Not just that. Walls break too. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> now when now when it comes to the uh, now when it comes to the classes, you've got you've mentioned that you've got seven of them. Um, yeah. And each of them. Is it a case where at a cer at a certain level of development you pick between a you pick between a subclass or is the class subclass relationship a bit different? No, it's more it's more fluid than that. Uh, the subclasses uh, are more uh, escom esque in that you can uh, that you can always if you feel that a skill that's available in a certain subclass is more interesting to the build you're currently going for, uh, then you can always pick that. When you meet the level of requirement, mm -hmm. so you're free to mix and match your characters the way you want. Um, each character also has, apart from the skills that are available um, to through their class, they have personal skills which distinguish the characters from each other within the class, mm -hmm. uh, and they also have uh, a couple of random skills that uh, differ from playthrough to playthrough yeah. that you can choose to spec into. Now. I do want to go. I do want to go into the classes that you've that you've present that you've presented in a bit of de in a bit of detail. Since, um, yeah. The now I'll start. I'll start with the legionnaire who I want. Yeah. Who I want their hat and and their cloak. <laughs> um, <laughs> but when when it comes when it comes to when it comes to them, I'm guessing that they would that they would fill a very sa sapper esque role of a lo of doing a lot of um, hit and run tactics. Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, the two subclasses uh, are Mage Hunter and Duelist, mm -hmm. and the Duelist is all about the duel system. So making like your like change, messing up your enemy duel bonuses, like making your own duel bonus stronger. Uh, whereas the Mage Hunter is more about uh, canceling out uh, the enemy mages and making sure that the rest of the squad stays stable uh, in, in a pattern form. So they do a lot of hit and run. They're definitely your light infantry. Uh, a squad of the game uh, disengages easily. I don't. I don't think. I know if I said that, but mm -hmm. but it, it, like opportunity attacks uh, play into the dual system a lot. Uh, so having a unit that's more nimble and more able to navigate a complex battle map of multiple duels is basically what the legionnaire is about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the guardian, I I look at that and I and I see. Okay, this is the tanky boy. Yeah, that's that's not too far off. Um, 
we we wanted something what what i wanted with it was a tank that is also a solid dps uh, unit i've never understood the tendency to have uh, the biggest man the biggest warrior with the biggest evil evilest warhammer be the guy who does the least damage because apparently that's how tanks work i don't know <laughs> but uh, so i wanted i wanted to to get away with that so it's also like a heavy front liner mm-hmm. um and and somebody that messes with has a if you go into the vanguard uh, skill tree somebody that also has a a slight amount of battlefield control uh in it that it can inspire your allies and like intimidate your enemies um also playing into the stability system a little bit so so we try to we we we, we do realize that there had to be some sort of tank role to be filled but we also mm-hmm. didn't want it to be just that uh, and i think we've i think we got something pretty good with the guardian yeah from what from what i'm seeing it's it appears that um you're that you're leaning a look that you're trying to lean towards not having classes be um one trick ponies for lack of a better term yeah yeah that was important to us definitely um and it's and at the very at the very least, I can say that the idea of a of a tank of a tank with two shields is some is something that I don't see often. Usually, it's the old sword and board approach. Yeah, yeah. The, the lantern shields were uh, were just way too cool to not put in the game. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Now, when it com- now when it comes to when it comes to sappers, I'm guessing the. These are these are the guys who are your ex, who are your experts at AOE stuff. Yeah, AOE and 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 also the traps. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so so setting up really like messing up the battlefield with big effects that target multiple tiles. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, there's a huge resource game to play with the Saber because it is uh, like. Uh, the class that has use per battle the most because once you spend all your grenades or all your traps it's it's basically a guy with a gun which mm-hmm. is interesting but the marksman is a much better like ranged fighter than the sapper is but the sapper has those munitions and yeah. that is that is what it's about making making tough decisions on when to when to spend your spend your grenades and your traps also don't, don't think i didn't notice that that little that little activate your trap cards thing that you snuck in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I couldn't uh, couldn't help it. <laughs> um, now, when it comes to marksmen, I'm guess I'm guessing that's exactly what it says on the tin. They're they're the bowmans who who um let who like to keep you very very far away. Yeah. Yeah, at least for the trick shot. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the the phantom part uh, is is more stealthy. Uh, can go closer, can scout out the enemy, and can do little shenanigans uh, with the pattern, uh, jumping in and out of uh, of pattern sight, and uh, and doing something a little bit similar to the to the obfuscate mechanic uh, mm-hmm. from from vampire. Now that we're talking vampire inspirations. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Now. When it comes now, when it comes to the first mage instance, the uh, shape mage, yeah. um, give now with would they be, would they be the wizard equivalent in this in the sense that they're going to have the um, broadest variety of um spe- of spells compared to the other magic users? Yeah, the uh, so, so the other magic users, the, the prodigy is much more of of like a warrior mage, uh, uh like. Partly inspired by Templars from 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 XCOM, and but also by like like they're actually in, in certain cases more rogue than mage. If you want to use like classical RPG um, like wording, uh, whereas the shape mage is definitely has a broader palette of spells, but is also not uh, like what we wanted to was not to have sort of your 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 atypical mage that just tries to to assault enemies with low defenses toward magic uh i wanted something that is both um yeah like i guess a couple of things i want to say first of all it was important to tie it to the lore Mm -hmm. that that 
you you deal a lot with stability you deal a lot with the stability of your allies the stability of your enemies um and are able to to use your spells to like buff your allies uh and and, and debuff the enemy and and do it a little bit differently with with where you also assault the emotions and the mind of the enemy uh mechanically i guess it kind of turns out in in typical debuffs and and penalty effects but uh but at least uh, it was important to have that lore hook there. Uh, I also really happy with the design, like uh, that Arcus did, that uh, that the mages aren't just wearing robes; that they have the cuirasses. They're actually wearing armor on the mm-hmm. battlefield, as they should, because it's it's weird that it's, it's been weird to me that in most fantasy system mages are just just don't train and don't like <laughs> wear proper equipment. Um, I when it comes to when it comes to that, I can I consider that a um, I consider that a vic- a victim of tradition. Um, sure, is when it because in um in say Tolkien's work, metal does mm-hmm. interfere with with um with magic use, so they so that would be minimized. But when you're trying to bring that into things that um, aren't Tolkien, it starts to make less sense. It actually, it actually does in in Corsano as well. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think we got around to that when we discussed the pattern. That uh, one of the things is that uh, some of the most perfect patterns of the world, mm-hmm. like patterns that are very hard to manipulate and break, are patterns of precious metals. So, if you know from like real world physics and chemistry that that metals have like like a, a perfect amount of electrons. Um, so so silver and gold and platinum and iridium and these kind of metals. Uh, uh, have an effect on on magic and shape magic in particular. So the mage blade that the mages use have a gilded end uh, that you use to actually attack the pattern more than attack the actual target. And if you have enemies wearing um, uh, like precious metals, like gilded armor or gilded helmet or or inlaid silvery stuff then it gets tougher to manipulate their patterns because the precious metals are scrambling it up so we do have some of that actually Mm -hmm. um it's just that's just that's just that's always been my that's always been my feeling when it comes to it or some some have made the argument that um that it's harder to focus in 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 heavy armor but i've never bought i've never bought that one either because enough training will overcome that kind of thing I mean, it's a it's a suspension of disbelief, and 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 being a huge fantasy fan, I can also respect a good trope uh, when it's well utilized. So it, it doesn't bother me. I'm I as much. I'm just uh, I'm just happy that we we managed to do some designs where the mages wear armor, but of course they're not in in like full plate or something like that. Yeah, but e- but even with that, you're still dealing with a mercenary company. You're not dealing with the scholarly wizard in in secluded in their tower or something like that if anybody's going to be nope. secluded in their tower it's going to be it's going to be sappers so that they don't bl- <laughs> blow something up again exactly it's uh it's much more it's much more like every day with the mages it's not like a high level shape mage is certainly like rare uh and and this is a, a it's a valued individual mm-hmm. but uh but it's but like most armies will have dozens of them being there and they're also used for all kinds of other things because of their ability to to shape not only like the physical patterns but also mental and sensory patterns they're excellent for spy work and for you know like uh, uh, having them at court so to make sure that you're not your mind is not being manipulated by your enemies stuff like that mm-hmm. now when now um and i'm get i'm guessing that with that with the uh, skill set met um Menders is Menders is more of a bu- is more of a buffing one, whereas Instigator might be more of a debuff. You would be absolutely correct in guessing that. Right. Um, yeah. Now, when it comes to the Prodigy, um, when I talked about th- when I talked about this on the Gazette, um, one of my co- one of my colleagues had com- had um, compared had compared the Prodigies to vampires. Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely like a vampire inspiration there, uh, in that for the siphon magic to work, you have to kill your enemies and then steal their pattern, and that gives you a much 
broader pattern, which is, I guess, like would be akin to having your soul enlarged for a set amount of time. And that the rush of that, so there's there's definitely some addiction there. There is some like darkness there that that there is a something that you can get addicted to. Uh, the feeling of the rush of having yourself being basically like expanded, like being much more than than what you what you are uh, at a regular. And after after siphoning, like the world will seem dull and colorless for for a set period of time. So there's definitely a vampire inspiration there. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also a bit of like a, a a Jedi thing going on with them being these sort of like. It, now I'm going into parts of the lore that we haven't really discussed, but being like agents of the church, in mm-hmm. uh, in being able to act on their own, um, and uh, being these sort of like super soldiers that when they're fighting, if they once they start killing people, they start snowballing and becoming much more powerful for a short amount of time that is mortally possible by anybody else. Yeah, I can get, I can definitely get that. Um... When it comes now, when it comes to um, str- when it comes to the stratagem um, part part of the equation, yeah, um, is is that is is that a ca- is that a case of um, of like a- of like extra extra factors within it within encounters or how does that particularly work? So the idea behind it was that um, you often see in in strategy games like you have a main quest like a certain thing you have to do on the map and then you have certain like little if you also do this you get a bonus uh, and what we wanted to be, but that also often means that you have to sort of play around something and like play outside of your comfort zone with what you would actually be like what what your strategy actually tries to be so mm-hmm. for example if there's like a sub goal in another game where you would be like um shoot, kill five people with a spear then you would have to bring a spear wielder it's sort of like a it's sort of like um like a, um uh, uh yeah i'm losing uh, my stream of conscience here uh so something that that like hampers your your ability to choose your own strategy and what we wanted with the strategy system was to give the player the option to pick a strategy that fits their play style uh and then have that influence like if they actually succeed in fulfilling that strategy that they make for the map um then they will get rewards based on that um, and I also really wanted to tie them into the lore. So, for example, one of the earliest battles of the game, uh, you're fighting down a rebellion, and there mm-hmm. are stratagems that are like let the rebels escape or try to kill them all, which um, like changes your relationship with your employer and with the rebel factions, uh, depending on if you succeeded and if you if you try to do it. Uh, there are also like stratagems that are like power through uh, enemy, uh, like uh, where they where they've set them up strong like palisades and stuff like that or try to sneak around um and the whole idea was that give the player some agency in what rewards them so basically have the the players pick their own achievement systems uh uh in in the middle of combat um to sort of tie the quest system of the game to like how you get experience how you get rewards tie that into both the story but also the actual tactical gameplay that happens Mm -hmm. now when it comes now when it comes to um the when it comes to the personalization of um improvements um when when specifically with um sigils and I'm see- and the image that I'm the image that I'm seeing. One thing that I was concerned about is what is the random part of it. Um, yeah. What's being done to make sure that it that it doesn't go too random when it comes to what abilities you end up getting. So uh, in in terms of character growths, uh, that's a balancing issue, and that is something that will probably be done with <laughs> towards the end of the game when we have the full game and has played it multiple times and, and are able to sort of balance the the finer uh, growth rates of the individual characters. Uh, also added the sigils there to to make sure that the players can, to a certain degree, be like, okay, now this character needs some more agility, so I'm actually gonna 
brand them with a sigil, which means that they'll be more their pattern will be less stable, but they'll grow towards something that the player uh, desires. Uh, in terms of the skills, uh, if you're looking at the skill tree, you'll notice that the random skills are the ones on the far right, uh, which is only two of them. Um, so it's it's a way of making sure that characters can sometimes you can get like a perfect character where you're like mm -hmm. oh, I really want to have this skill on that character, and then at certain playthroughs you get that opportunity and you actually get that character. Uh, but it's also it's also like kept at two skills to make sure it doesn't like take take uh, take over the entire game and you get a totally unbalanced squad uh, because that would also suck. So the the, the short answer is that uh, that it's it's up to us uh, doing the the hard work and balancing the game properly. All right, I can I can um, I can definitely get behind that. Um, now. When it comes now, um, in the image that it that's shown when it when it comes to when it comes to pattern smith and the like, what I'm curious is what each of the uh, symbols for the on the columns are. I'm guessing the one that's the fur that's the furthest to the left yeah. is the is the randomized parts. But um, yeah. So what uh, you're seeing what you, what you're seeing right now in the in the skill tree is is a guardian skill tree. Mm -hmm. So the first one is the shield or the like the tower shield, which is the which is for the sentinel uh, sub skill system. Mm -hmm. And then if you go as you go to the right, you see the vanguard's gauntlet. Then you see uh, the skull, which is uh, the personal like the character skills. Mm -hmm. And then you see the dice, which are the random skills that you that you get. Uh, All right. So is it a case where you um is it a case where you'd slot them in? Yeah, so this is quite a developed character. This is like a level 25 character where all the skills have been revealed. Uh, if you look at like a lower level character, I think we have some maybe in some of the footage. Maybe it wasn't released. You can see them being locked. That mm -hmm. that uh, that you you you. So the tiers, like the different lines, is, is every five levels. So it's level five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and twenty-five, where you get access to new skills. All right. Um. And when and um. Of course, when it com when it comes to when it com when it comes to the whole concept of the mercenary camp, that's where I definitely started seeing the um, the influence of Fire Emblem with it. Um, yeah, especially since there's pro there's there's probably gonna, there's probably going to be some, there's probably is there going to be some sort of relationship grading like there like there is. When it comes to um, Fire Emblem, or is that not a plan? Uh, there, there's a plan for it in terms of factions that you can clearly see your reputation with different factions, and you can get, sort of gauge that through the strategist and through like uh, the the information that's available to the mercenary company. For individual characters, uh, there will be I there will be definitely be of course relationships because it's it's a story based game and your actions will change the way different characters look at you. Mm -hmm. Whether or not it's gonna be reveal to the player like what your relationship is with different characters i'm i'm still trying to figure that out i think there's like pros and cons like pros is that you can manage it more uh but the cons are that it's kind of a gamification of something that takes you out of the story a little bit that uh, that you can you can just go and improve your relationship in air quotes mm -hmm. uh with certain characters which is which is a bit harmful when you're trying to tell uh, a mature darker grittier fantasy story uh, uh, that it, it might get too gamey, uh, but there's also like that people people like to know how how uh, how what they do and how they play affect the games more meticulously. So uh, so uh, it might get it might be like something you can see physically. It might also be something that you kind of have to figure out and play around. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes now when it comes to um... When it comes to the when it comes to the soundtrack design, you mentioned it being um, procedurally generated. What I'm curious about is, when it came to the sound design, would you say that it's one that's built in layers based on what's going on? Yeah. Uh, now I'm getting a little bit on uh, deep water because my my composer and sound designer Daniel would would be much better at explaining exactly how it's done. Uh, but the way it like roughly the way it works is that we have different scores in the game. I mentioned some of them before, like the reputation you have with different factions, uh, and we constantly track the choices you make in terms of uh, like 
style of it, like how how violent is it, how 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 soft is it, stuff like that. Uh, some of that will figure into the soundtrack, but a lot of it will also be like what is going on right now in the tactical gameplay. So, for example, as mentioned, if you if you're losing, the soundtrack changes. If you're winning, the soundtrack changes. If you're using certain characters, the soundtrack changes a little bit. Uh, if you're like like if you have status ailments, if you have like the idea is to make like a full experience where where what's like the music that you're presented to sort of fits uh fits what's going on on the battlefield so that it's not just like a combat theme that mm -hmm. you're listening to um so what you're seeing there like the, the the piece that's online like the battle suite is like a selection of those things uh but you're never gonna hear it like that because the soundtrack constantly adopts like from bar to bar like what is going on depending on how many enemies are on the map uh like how many of your characters are left and able to fight all of these kind of things mm -hmm. and it's something that we are like constantly exploring and uh, daniel has so many cool ideas for what should be like should the soundtrack change a little bit depending on your equipment on the amount of damage you've taken on how deep stabilized you are and in the end we're going to have to make some decisions uh but uh but I think what is what's going to come out of it is going to be pretty special. And I'll def I'll definitely be um, look be looking forward to it. Thank you. Now, when it comes now when it comes to you guys have you guys have stated that you're that you're shooting for a twenty a um I believe it was twenty twenty two release. Yeah. Um. Now I'm now one of the things I was curious about was was um what was um is it how far, how as far percentage wise how far along would you say would you say that you are currently would you like are we talking like thirty percent? Uh, it's kind of hard to put a number on it. Mm -hmm. I I'd say we're almost done with all that would typically be considered design and development. So that we kind of know the story, we kind of know the art style. We we know like all of these like very important questions have been answered, uh, um, and we are mechanics-wise quite far along. Like uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of good code there, and a lot mm -hmm. of of the features are implemented. Uh, so most of what is left is just like how would you say like you know the 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 actual production of it, so that sculpt all the character models, write all the actual dialogue, uh, draw all the character portraits, compose mm -hmm. all the soundtrack pieces. Uh, that we, we have some of that, like in terms of that, I think 30 is not a bad number. Um, uh, but that is what that is what's next for us after the campaign. It's like actually starting uh, starting doing the, so, so we have most of it as prototypes, obviously, like otherwise it's mm -hmm. hard to, to balance the the RPG system and the and the combat encounters, uh, but uh, but you do all sorts of like little tricks with using unfinished art and uh, and trying to get there. Uh, but uh, but yeah, what's like there's going to be a lot of it's going to be a lot of production, like actually creating the assets, and then after that there's going to be a lot of testing and polish to make sure it's as good as it's going to get before release. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah. um, <laughs> I, I'm also—I should state—I'm also the game's producer, and I should have a more clear answer to that question. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> um, but yeah. Well, ju well, just when, just when everybody thinks they have the answers, I change the questions. Aha. Um, now, taking that, taking that, taking all that, taking all that into uh, into a, into account. Um, yeah. Like we're in, we're in a kind of interesting period when it when it comes to when it when it comes to game de when it comes to game development because you you mentioned that you want you want to put this on PC and on the uh, major consoles, um, yeah. But we're kind we're kind of in this in that awkward period where we're, where we're between console generations. Yes. So when you so when you say putting on PC and consoles, I'm guessing that you um that that um getting a dev getting a dev kit for the PS5 or the Series X is um not high priority at this point. No, not at this point. I mean, right now, like the way like we do it, and I think most people do it. Like 
I'm not again. So Scarlet Republic is our, is our first major game as a studio. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so I don't have that much experience to talk from. But what we're basically doing is that is that we're we're developing the PC version and testing the PC version while slowly and that's also something we have to get into now getting those dev kits and starting to, to do the porting. So what, what you need to do is you, you need to set it up so that it's not impossible to port or that it's hard to port. Like it, it can't be like only functional and on PC. Uh, but but there is like, I, I should not talk about this because the technical director is gonna, is gonna punch me for saying stupid stuff that I don't know about. But, um, but, but I, I, I don't think it's high priority. But as we get closer and closer, I, I'm, I'm, I'm like when we started developing the game two years ago, I, I, what we were obviously thinking PS4 and 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 that generation. Uh, but now, as the game has been in development for two years and probably has two years more of development left before uh, it's actually gonna get out there, or one and a half, mm-hmm. uh, uh, I think it's 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 probably gonna end up in a way that we'll have to look to next gen. Uh, I don't know. Depends, like, depends how. It, if this generation is much like the other generations, then, then probably people will not be playing their PS4s a lot, in in two years. So that probably forces us to move on to the next generation. That's also the reason why we didn't put PS4 or PS5 there because it's still something that we're discussing internally. Like, do we do we come out on one or the other or on both? I think I. Given how given how I've seen cer- um, certain Kickstarters um, really overplay their really overplay their hands when it com- when it comes to it, it might yeah. it might be best to not, to um, do the approach that you're doing where you're focusing on the PC version and then the and then the other parts because um, sometimes sometimes from what I've been told sometimes getting dev kits is easier said than done and uh, and there's also the fact that having to d- having to deal with um all those di- all those different SKUs can can o- can overwhelm if somebody do- if somebody isn't careful yeah yeah uh, and 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 I, I i agree with that but i also when i also i'm also pretty confident that it's it's been done before and and we can do it mm-hmm. uh we just need to figure out how and uh, I'm also it's also one of the places where I'm open to partnering with somebody who's very good at porting uh, so you have certain studios that focus on that and you also have some publishers that could help with that so there's there are all kinds of options that can be explored there but that is probably not going to be in the very immediate future uh, because for now we're focusing on, on developing the game and making it awesome yeah. and I'll, I'll um, definitely be looking forward to 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 that um and ma- and ho- and making sure that <laughs> that rng is um fair is it's going to be merciless because the dice gods show no mercy but it but <laughs> but um it won't be too merciless i i i i wrote in another interview that i uh i i i, I aim to design it so that uh, so that players uh, feel like they're not just victim to evil RNG, but also I think it would be a shame if the players haven't cursed my rotten guts at least once or twice during the campaign. Well, I'm an equal opportunity offender. I curse everybody's guts. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, but with but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and. Enjoy the particular insanity that com- that comes with it. Yeah, it's it's always a pleasure to talk about the game. And so I'm, uh... anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. And as we often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm also out of wine. So, uh, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> that is uh, that is good, man. It's been a pleasure, and uh, and yeah, I I I feel I feel a bit enlightened. I'd say, I'd say. And then I've done. Then I've done my job. Um, Namaste. And, and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy, to enjoy the insanity here. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. 
stay fucking frosty, everybody.